Welcome to Meta Analysis for Hedgehogs. How do you unpack a file that's packed with a packer whose packer stuff is a huge obfuscated audit script? Let's explore this today. Um, I received this sample from someone else. Um, they requested me to showcase this, so that's what we're gonna do now. So this is the sample that I received. And the first thing we see, it has a, um, a tag for formbook malware family, which is an info sealer. So that's interesting. Um, let's look at the Yara results here. And here is one indicator that this is auto it. Now, the person who gave me the sample specifically requested that we look at the auto it script and how to unpack this file. So this might give us a first hint that this is an auto -it executable. And what we also see here is other malware families and form books. So this mentions agent Tesla version one and two. And here is some more like yeah, capability Java rules. So some anti-debugging mechanisms that they find here as well, that it's generally packed browser references and confidential data store references, messaging clients. So this is not unexpected from an information stealer. So this kind of fits into the whole idea that this might be an information stealer. And now we have a Maldoc signature. That's a little bit weird. Why, what would it have to do with a Maldoc? But when you look into these signatures, you can search for the rule name, find the repo. These are pretty generic, like they don't match only on documents. This doesn't make sense at all. I mean, no matter where you take this impash from, if it's from the audit executable, uh, you will match all audit executables. And if it's on the .NET sample, you match all .NET samples or all .NET applications because they all have the same imports. So we have Asian Tesla again. So this is overwhelmingly hinting to agent Tesla, whereas the submitter says it's form book. So we should probably take a look at this and find ourselves what kind of malware this is. So this is uh, the auto it sample. I already named it auto it packed because the person who gave it to me said they want to specifically know how to unpack this auto it executable and how to approach audit in general. But usually you just put the sample into detect and easy if you don't know what, what kind of um, sample it is. And then you will see here, okay, it's auto it. And let's look at the signature and something else you can see here in the signature is it checks for resource named script. And that's also how you can recognize that it's an auto it compiled auto it script. So you use something like resource hacker, put the file in there and in the RC data, you will find the script resource, which should start with a U3. And that's like the magic for auto it. Let's try to unpack it. So let's open command prompt here. And what you need is audit ripper. So this is how you would install it. I already have it here. So it requires an output dir. So let's put dot there. It's complaining about the magic mismatch, but it's still extracting a script and two files with weird names. So here they are. And now just like when you get a new sample you know nothing about, you basically handle these samples the same. You do triage on them and see what you find there. So the first thing you would probably do is look at the script because uh, that seems to be the most interesting part here, but the script is pretty large and, and it all looks similar. So when you scroll through this, I, the code somewhat looks similarly structured. 
So well, let's look at those samples here also before we dive deeper into the script. So that looks interesting because here what you may notice is a repeating pattern. So uh, this is encrypted and yeah, I guess we will have to find the portion where it's being decrypted. And the other file, similar thing, but here is where I just cheated. I'm gonna show you two ways to deal with this sample. The first way I'm gonna show you is more when, when you have a lot of experience, you will recognize this as what it is. And that is very, very typical for a PE file. Why? Because here you have kind of patterns, like this is a repeating pattern right here. So repeating pattern may be some X or key in this case that has a size of 10. So decimal 10 or A in hex. So this might be the key here just from checking where it's repeated. And the pattern repeats because there are lots of areas in PE files that have zeros. So this is the actual plain text key you see here. And then above you see something that resembles like the DOS stop um, MZ and here is probably the DOS stop message. And in between you have some values that are set in the header. So and somewhere here, it's probably where the PE header starts. So this is the way you would approach this as a, if you have some experience and recognize that this is just XOR encrypted. I mean, you can't be entirely sure, but the key here, you could use some brute forcing tools. There are some, uh, but in this case, you can also just test it and see if it works. This has 10 as a, as a size. So let's count it 10 until we receive, until we know where this string actually starts. So here, so it starts with R H T E. So that's basically where I would put the starting point here. So let's use this as a key. You can use CyberShare for anything else. I'm going to use binary refinery. So that was obviously not correct because it doesn't look like the dust stop. So something's still wrong, but we got the start of the key correct. So probably above we have this pattern. So there's probably one of the things that are a little bit different here. Let's look at this. I added one character here that the length was not correct. Let's look at this and we are done. So if you want to dump it, you could so when you analyze this, then you may, you will know, is this like a malware or is this like an assisting file? Like what's an assisting file? Sometimes you have like DLLs that perform injection or stuff like that. In this case, it's a payload. Now this feels a lot like cheating probably. And of course I want to do what um, the uh, person told me they, they want to know. So they want to know how to approach the script. And there are good reasons why you may still want to analyze this auto script. Now, if unpacking is your only goal, like, of course, this is the fastest way. But if your goal is maybe writing a blog article, then you may want to write about the packer too. Or let's say you want to know how to create a good signature for the antivirus product and the antivirus product is able to see processes, process memory, then you may want to check how the packer works just so you can create an antivirus signature on some parts of the packer that do not change too soon. Anyhow, there are always some good reasons why you still want to um, analyze a script. And of course, next time this encryption may not be as easy to crack. So. 
let's see how we could find out what kind of encryption is being used if you do not immediately see it from the file. So the question is now, how do you approach huge scripts and how do you find the actually interesting code? Now, the first thing I recommend is maybe get a little bit familiar with the language, in this case, order it, and then you should put this file into an automatic sandbox system. Put it there, see how it behaves, how try to find out how the unpacking may work, how it may take place. So this file will be doing certain actions and certain things that have to be reflected in the code. Your goal would be to find any functions and order it that correspond to what this script has to do when it does its unpacking part. Now you can already assume, okay, it could be something that's going to use file read mechanisms for these files. So these are things you can already infer. And that's actually also what I did. I just use this knowledge that this is going to touch or grab those files because this is the encrypted payload, which I already knew by then. But you can also just think, okay, the, these files are, are there for a certain purpose. So let's just search for the file names here. And the other thing you can do, because this file is not extremely big, like if you're really desperate and you have like no idea how to proceed, just scroll through. This is not too big to do this. Like it takes a year, it takes a few minutes. Uh, uh, scroll through and at some point you may see something that pops out, which could also have to do with experience. I don't know, but... In the beginning, in my the very first years, a lot of scrolling was done from my part. <laughs> Aimless scrolling and seeing if I find anything interesting. But here, I really recommend look for the file name. And there you go. So here you know, okay, here it's going to touch those files. And the very first thing that I see here is, uh, this code looks different to the parts that were before that. And here is one function being called with a weird string and a number that is always eight. So this looks like an, a string decryption function. And the function is here. So this is something we should start with. So we are going to create a string decryptor in order to understand this code. But without knowing those strings, you also see, okay, it's creating some struct, it's calling with DLL call some functions. So this is gonna be the interesting part. So one of the ways you can approach this is by replicating, replicating this function in a Python script. So let's do this. I'm gonna copy this to second script here because I want to rename these variable names here. We have here something that is being returned as a result. So this is the result. Then this will iterate with this variable towards the string length of this argument. So that is the index. This has to be the encrypted string. And we also know that it's, be it's being used in that way. So that this is a string and this is a number here. And then this is the weird number here. Which is actually just eight. Like in all of these cases, this number was eight. You can now simply retype the very same algorithm in Python. Even if it was a little bit more complicated, you could just go line by line and try to translate the very same algorithm. The biggest difficulty is probably here in translating 
unfamiliar things, like if you're not familiar with audit, uh, but simply Google those functions, Google audit, string mid, see what it does, Google audit, ask, and then understand what this is doing. And similarly, you need to understand like basic syntax. This is the same as um, string concatenation here. So the same in Python would be plus equals. You gotta understand the the language that you are reading in order to reverse engineer properly. So here we have a for loop, and we are gonna use this index, and it starts from one and it goes up to the length of the string. Now what this line does, it checks if the index is even or odd. If it's even, it's gonna subtract this number and if it's odd, it's gonna add this number. So we simply do the same. And what this is, it simply takes the um, one character that is at the specified index. Because strings are treated as lists by Python, this part is the same as just accessing the list at position index. Now this is not gonna work because of the type system. And that is what these two are doing. So firstly, it's gonna change whatever is in this string, whatever characters in this string into a number. And in Python, this is ORT. And it is doing that so it can subtract this number. But afterwards, we actually want to have a string. So afterwards, it's going to change the result to a string. Conveniently, this function is named the same in Python as in AutoIt. For this one, we can simply copy paste this and say plus. and then we return the result string. Now all we gotta do is test this. So let's put this to the test. By the way, you see this execute function right here. This is also something you could have searched for, like, and you know it's gonna be executing something, you can search for execute. Let's simply choose one of the longer ones. and see what happens. I need to get out of the restricted mode here. And now I can run it as a Python file, please. And nothing will happen because I didn't print the result. And an exception occurred. What is this string index out of range here, yeah, of course. because of this one. So this is not working. And the reason is an off by one error. So the array here, it starts at zero. Whereas in order it, I guess it starts at one. So it is like those subtle differences that can make you crazy. Let's remove this part. Most of the time when you get problems with encryption or decryption, it's because of off by one errors. So the thing you do is you try those first and then see if it fixes the issue. And in this case, indeed, we need to use one um, index less so that we start at zero. When you look here, it will start at one and this will decrypt the whole string. So that means that these strings start at index one. So this is like some of the oddities of um, yeah, between languages that some have like different indexing mechanisms. And since we start at minus one, we need to add here another index 
to the final length. Otherwise, we will miss the very last character. And now we're going to try again. And what we get here is kernel 32 as a decrypted string. So this works. And now we can decrypt all of these strings. However, you do not actually want to do this by hand. I mean, in this case, it would work. It's not that much. If you check, count how many times this is being used, it's 21 times. So you could do it by hand. It's still boring. So don't do that if you can avoid it. And because next time you get a similar sample, you don't want to do this all again manually. So this will be the next part. Just find a way to replace this. And for that, we are going to open this script in Python and find all of the function calls here. Actually, not this one, because here we do not see the contents easily, but here, these function calls, and then going to replace them with the decrypted string. So let's try to create a regex so that we can get all of these functions here. I'm going to copy this out. Go to regex 101. And we want Python. And now we try to build this regex. So we want this part. And the string is actually what we want to extract because the number eight is always the same. So we put a capture group here and the string will be this. And the string ends at the quotes. And now you get the problem that this is um, a greedy match. So you see it's going to choose the biggest string that satisfies this. And since we do not want it to be greedy, we put the question mark here to choose the shortest match instead. And afterwards, we have some more stuffs followed by the close. And that also shouldn't be greedy. Now you can do some more things like put a question mark here just in case there's no space somewhere in the file. But yeah, that, that looks like a regular expression we can use. So we need to import RE. This is our regex. Put our file here. Let's copy the path from here. We wanna read this. Let's actually put the path here. So this is the script path. So we read in this file and we need to um, find all matches for this regex. So the way we can do this is say um, re compile this regex. And now we say find all of the matches on our data. And what we're going to find is the stuff in the capture group. So we can just decrypt this and just print, decrypt this and print it. Let's see if this works. Ah, yeah, that's uh, because I want to read it like that. And here we get the decoded strings. So this worked very well. The only string that didn't really seem to work is this one, but um, you can look into this later. So in general, it seems to work. And now 
instead of just printing the decoded results, we actually want to replace things in there. So let's add another capture group because we need the whole string too. Now if you print the match, we'll see that it looks a bit different now. Let's look, start. Um, so this is a tuple now consisting of the first capture group and the second capture group. So this is the string and this is this, the thing we want to replace this with. So that's what we're going to do. So decrypted string is match one and the original string match zero. So just some debugging print and then we call replace for original and replace it with the decrypted string, but this part must be put into the quotes again. Uh, original string. And this is what we're gonna use to write, um, then we need to write the data basically. So let's say dump data and when I'm creating, clean this up a little bit, creating a function to dump the file. Output file, where we want to dump it to is the script path plus something like decrypted or decoded, deobfuscated. I'm calling it deobfus. Yeah, I think that's better. And that should be it. Let's see if it works. So these are the instances and what they were replaced with. And we did some mistake here, I think. Type error must be string, not bytes. Oh, of course, WB, but also the decrypted string, yeah, I forgot to decrypt, of course. Decrypt. Now it should work. So here we see all the replacements. And now we got to look at the deobfuscated script. Here it is. Put this to order it. find our location and it worked. So here you can now see or understand more closely what this code actually does. It's gonna put those files into temp folder. It's reading this mbparse file here. Here's some decoding happening with something that's from this file. So this file, you can decode it with our decryption function. So everything that's inside this one. And the other one, that's the one where the payload is inside. So this is gonna be handled here, or maybe not. It's not gonna be handled here, I guess. It's just putting the file into the temp folder, and then it's doing something with this file. So it's decoding it. Here we have the file. Here it takes the length of it, and it calls the alloc for this size and for this data. It's gonna execute this at offset zero, then it creates some struct, and then it's gonna execute call window procedure at this offset. It seems, would probably be shellcode, so this is the file you would have to look at to find out how this file is encrypted, I guess, because nothing much else is happening here. Um, this stuff here, 
looks just like the garbage that's in front. So this is just junk. I don't think there's anything else happening in this file, uh, in this audit script that is of interest. So we have to look at decoding this. We already know how to decode it. It's like the very same decrypt function that we just created. So you know what we have to do. We have to extend our script to decode the shell code, right? So now we have the shell code path. So all I did was replicate the part of the auto it script that does the shellcode decryption. So let's also do this. And we run this. And it says data written to MB pers decrypted. Let's take a look at the file here. And you can see we still need to fully decode this. So we have here hex strings, but this looks like code. It actually looks like code. Um, this part, I'm not sure where this comes from. We can probably just remove it. Let's do that. And I'm now, yes, save the changes. I'm now opening this file in the Notepad++ editor we can use the plugin function with the hex to ASCII converter. Do that, save it, and take a look at it again. So this is going to be our code, I guess. But it looks good. You see the C's in here, so this is probably code. So I open this up as x86 because the code before that was also in it's it's an it's a thirty two bit file, so that's the reason. So I'm guessing that this shell code is also thirty two bit. So one thing we can already look at is this. Uh, so here are some interesting strings. We check this, press R. So this translates to kernel thirty two DLL, right? can find more like these here. So this is probably preparing everything to have some APIs available. And then you may remember we had the script calling a certain offset, which is here. Just translate this to a hex. So that's this and hex. And let's go there. Let's find this address file offset, doesn't matter here. And that's where we arrive at. So let's make this a function. Make function at this address, default. And here we are. So this is copying some string. And do you remember what this string is? So this was our XOR key that you have seen earlier. So we know this is the XOR key, right? Now let's follow up where this key is, key is being used. And it's here. So here we have the XOR keys supplied to a function. And there are some other variables here inside. I mean, here's also one interesting part that I want to look at actually. Let's see. So this is getting the encrypted payload. That's the, the file with the encrypted payload. And this function doing something with the exor key and if you go inside this function then you can see ah okay this is performing the exor decryption here now the last part or mystery we need to solve is what kind of payload is this actually that's the payload right here and you will notice it's a .NET file so you can put it in the NSPY and look at it it's a little bit obfuscated but I have a whole lot of malware Java signatures and they identified this file as origin logger for me. So origin logger is an agent Tesla variant 
and that is just this um, origin locker. I'm just going to show you quickly how you get to the configuration. So I have a config extractor for this file on my GitHub that you can use. So if you also want to extract the config, you can navigate to my GitHub repository, Struppige Hedgehog Tools, and there you see the agent Tesla folder. Yeah, I recommend just download the whole repository contents here, like that with download zip. Um, then you extract this, and I already did this here. So I'm gonna open PowerShell to run this file. So when we extract this and you get uh, an error message that looks like this system not supported an attempt was made to load an assembly from a network location, which could have caused the assembly to be sandboxed and so on. So this problem is because here's the zone identifier on the end of the because we just, just downloaded this. So um, .NET doesn't trust this file as you downloaded this from your browser. To fix this, you can go to the properties and click on unblock and say okay. And now it should work in general. And yeah, the script is a bit a bit, little bit crude. Um, I don't know why, but I expect here a folder name. So this is kind of weird, but I, I'm gonna fix this, I promise. <laughs> um, so let's just put our payload in a folder so we can specify a folder name, um, which wouldn't be F now. Okay, and here we get the config. And the config is also saved in Agent Tesla configs, so you can access it again. And it's gonna save all of the configs, or append configs when, when you execute the file, so you find it um, on the bottom of this configuration list. So that's our samples config. You see is an FTP host, um, user, password, and so on. So all of the data that you usually want to know when you analyze a sample. So this is agent tester origin logger. It's not form book. What are some learnings from this session today? Well, first they would say decryption in the original language is way easier. So Today we translated audit into Python and I had some troubles because of some certain differences between the languages, namely um, the indexing of arrays or lists. So sometimes these things take way longer than they should. And if you'd simply copy and paste this into an audit decryption function, then it might be easier. Um, secondly, use your triage information to find the relevant code. So you have a huge string, then take the information that you already have of the sample or maybe gather some more. You can put it into automatic sandbox systems, execute it, monitor it, see what it does. And then from there, you have some data that you can use to find the relevant code. In this case, it was the file name that uh, allowed us to find the code. And certainly, Java rules are not really to be trusted, at least not fully to be trusted. So um, especially if these are just certain public Java rules and you don't know exactly how they are intended to be used and on, on which, in which constraints they were built, um, you should always verify if the data that you get from these is true. If you have any samples that you find interesting that you think might be suitable for me to teach something, you can send them to me, but uh, no promises that I will create a video out of them because it takes a ton of time to do that. Uh, so yeah, feel free. And um, please, if you have any questions, put them below. I always put the sample into the description below um, with a link to something like Mailshare or Malware Bazaar. So you can also download them. If you want to learn Mava analysis from the ground up, then check the link in the description below. There's a link to my Udemy course for beginners. 
It contains 11 hours of video content and uh, the link is a coupon link that's a little bit cheaper for you than um, buying it from Udemy itself. So check it out and maybe I see you there.